Hello, my name is Annalise and I'm here to introduce today's colloquium on the topic of semiotic repertoires. Why are we focusing on semiotic repertoires? Well, back in 1972, Gumpertz and Himes coined the term verbal repertoire. And they focused on communities of people who had various linguistic features and when considered together, that was termed a verbal repertoire. And since 1972, that term has somewhat gone out of use until recently, we've seen it emerging again. And people have been using that term verbal repertoire in relation to translanguaging theory. Translanguaging theory does not consider different languages to be discrete bounded entities, but rather as more fluid, flexible, blended systems. It focuses on how people actually use languages and focuses on the features that they use. And when considered together, those features are termed a repertoire. To date, many people have talked about linguistic repertoires. And for example, you can see on the screen this illustration that was taken from a book that was published on translanguaging by Garcia and Lee Wei. You can see the different boxes representing different languages as being separate on the top line, more dynamically interchangeable on the second line, and finally on the third line is a representation of translanguaging where the L representing languages and the F representing features can be combined together. And that is how translanguaging views languages. Now that term feature is a little bit abstract and can mean a variety of different things. But in the context of lang translanguaging theory, it is typically used in relation to words and letters. And it really focuses on how people combine letters to create words and combine words to create sentences and sounds to create words. So that means it's easy to overlook the other features that are available in communication, such as gesture, photographs and so forth, that can be brought into the communication process. But the focus has typically been on sounds, words and letters. In response to this concept of linguistic repertoire, the concept semiotic repertoire has been put forward, a broader concept. And that term semiotic repertoire was coined in 2017 when three colleagues and myself wrote an article, as you can see at the bottom of the slide. Now the article in the article, the four of us explained that to date, there had been research into the area of multimodality and communication where gestures and other features are used in parallel with speech, but of course speech remaining the predominant and most important feature, and that there's also a field of research into multilingual communication and how different languages can be used together. But in this field of research, there was no focus on the other gestural or visual types of communication that are available to us. So we wanted to bring these two concepts together, these two fields of research, and coin the term semiotic repertoire. Now that means that it is a focus on the vast variety of different features that we can bring to the communication process, such as gesture, signing, photographs, illustration, different objects, whatever is available and relevant to the particular communication interaction going on. And these features can be used simultaneously or in sequence with each other. So really, at that time, four years ago, when the article was published, our aim was firstly to try and develop a conceptual lens to look at interactions and communication, to look at them holistically with everything that's involved, speech, gesture, and all the options that are available in communication. But also to create a tool to help us bring together these different fields of research. To look at multimodal and multilingual communication together. And also the aim was to focus on documenting the features that are used 
in these communication interactions. And lastly, now we have the aim to theorise how this concept can be used. What the word, the term actually means. Using this lens, thinking of it as a tool, documenting the range of resources that are available, and now to try and develop a theory about how we can apply this notion of semiotic repertoires to the communication and interaction that we see. So we have four presentations today on two important topics. The first topic is distribution and the second is evaluation. In terms of distribution, to date people have considered these repertoires and resources to be located within individual people which means that we have seen phrases being used, such as an individual having their own repertoire or people bringing their repertoire to communication interactions or individuals having repertoires that do or don't overlap, miss or don't match. So now we need to slightly decentralise that concept away from just the individual to include things and people that can be involved in the communication process not just repertoires being situated within people. And when we think of it in this way, it leads us to the term semiotic assemblages, which means all the different resources that are available, whether situated in people, places, objects and time, when come, they are brought together, they create an assemblage. And these can be any resource, whether it be objects, words, anything that is available. But assemblages are resources that are relevant to a specific interaction, a specific communication event. And how are all these resources brought together to create an assemblage? It's through a process we call chaining. And it could be gestures, it could be words, it could be pictures that are linked together within an interaction. And when resources are pulled together repeatedly to form an assemblage, they become a script linked to a specific interaction or communication situation. This now brings us to our second topic, which is evaluation. And this is important because people evaluate the resources before using them in an interaction. For example, some resources are plentiful and available for the user to bring to the interaction, but sometimes people don't want to use all those resources in a specific communication situation, perhaps for ethical reasons or ideological reasons. Or there are barriers, for example, sensory asymmetries. So for example, deaf people who can't access spoken communication. Sometimes resources are evaluated on emotional basis or ideological basis or availability or in terms of accessibility. So these two topics of distribution and evaluation help us to better understand this term semiotic repertoire, what it means, how it's created, why it's created, who creates it, well not who, because of course it is not just an individual, as I've said, it's much more widely distributed. I hope you enjoy watching the presentations. Hi, uh, thanks to Annalise for that excellent introduction to the developments in uh, semiotic repertoires. So we've started from uh, thinking about uh, uh, semiotic repertoires as uh, largely linguistic uh, in some of the initial formulations by Compass and also located in the speech community. But we've gone on to now think of uh, repertoires more recently as um, individual, that is people in their own migrant trajectories develop their own repertoires that don't necessarily correspond to a particular speech community's total repertoires. And secondly, 
we have also uh, expanded our notion of um, semiotic repertoires from linguistic repertoires to multimodal repertoires and even objects and artifacts uh, as Rhymes and Lomart and colleagues have defined them. Uh, but one additional expansion in terms of the locus of repertoires is the spatial location of repertoires. That is, people not only use the semiotic repertoires that belong to a community, not only the things they bring with them, but in particular activities, the uh, context in which those activities are conducted will provide certain uh, repertoires that they use uh, in their communication. So this notion uh, started with an early formulation by Chuck Goodwin. So as you can see here, he calls uh, this a substrate that people use in their communication. And this substrate constitutes of a semiotic landscape that is um, uh, the uh, environment in which uh, these activities occur. And there is also a temporal dimension. Uh, he goes on to say, uh, the action now in progress provides certain resources that people might use. So Penny Cook and I have uh, called these spatial repertoires and uh, used it in our work. So I think I can illustrate the importance of spatial repertoires uh, with an example that uh, Goodin himself uh, provided. So in this uh, interaction, uh, Goodin's father, Chill, uh, has had a stroke and he's left with only three words, yes, no, and and. So we might say those are the three linguistic repertoires he shares uh, with his speech community, the English speaking community. In addition to that, he brings certain other verbal repertoires like de, de, de. Uh, these we might call his personal repertoires. He uses them strategically in particular contexts and they do develop indexicality, they become meaningful. But both types of repertoires have to work in relation to the spatial repertoires uh, for him to communicate his meanings. So a lot of times he would point to objects in the environment, uh, like the grapes he wants to eat. In this interaction, there's also a temporal dimension in how we strategically interjects uh, the repertoires he brings with himself into the ongoing communication. So Chuck asks, was he a radiologist? Pat responds, he was chief of radiology at Columbia Presbyterian Medical Center. And Chill uh, positions uh, his uh, one uh, uh, linguistic repertoire from the speech community, yes. And also his personal repertoires, uh, the DDD, the, uh, right uh, around the place where Pat says Columbia uh, to indicate that he's in agreement. And then he also uses his gaze to look at Chuck and indicate he is the a recipient of this new information and positions himself as uh, uh, enjoying epistemic authority here. So the ongoing conversation, the place, the timing, uh, the gesture, uh, the gaze, all of them work in uh, 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 together uh, for uh, Chill uh, to communicate his meaning. So from that example, uh, we can also answer a few other concerns that have developed over time in uh, theorizing spatial repertoires. And um, Annalise and her colleagues in an early article uh, said, uh, we should uh, go beyond just uh, inventorizing semiotic repertoires and identifying them to talking about uh, making distinctions about which resources are permanent and which are temporary. In this example, uh, we might say uh, the spatial repertoires are uh, uh, temporary because uh, imagine if uh, Chuck is seated in a different position, if all, I'm sorry, all three of them, if they are all seated in a different position, if they're all seated side by side. Now, uh, Chill can't look at uh, Chuck the same way uh, to uh, indicate who is the recipient of the new information. He might have to touch the hand in order to convey that. So uh, that's um, some of the spatial repertoires are not permanent. Same thing about objects that might be in the environment. Same thing about Pat's utterance. If she had not uttered those lines, but something else, uh, Chill would have had to think about a different strategy to communicate himself. But at the same time, 
uh, the spatial repertoires are important uh, for chill. So uh, Annalise and others talk about making distinctions about hierarchical constellations, which semiotic uh, repertoires are important for a particular activity. In this case, uh, for chill, the spatial repertoires are extremely important because he has only three words from the speech community of the English language speakers. And his personal repertoire of verbal uh, utter the sounds uh, may not be uh, uh, very meaningful without the spatial repertoires. So if you think along those lines, uh, what we find is that um, to think of uh, Chill's ability to communicate to himself uh, takes distributed practice. Uh, that is, uh, uh, he, first of all, uh, he, his, all his semiotic rep repertoires have to work together. Secondly, there's also the distributed practice with the social agents. Uh, um, Chuck and Pat have to collaborate with him. They have to show a willingness to uh, 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 draw from all the semiotic repertoires uh, Chill is using, and also to uh, uh, negotiate meanings with him. So if you think along those lines, we have to rethink this notion of competence. You know, if you think of uh, uh, Chill's competence only in terms of the grammatical repertoires he brings with himself, some people might think he's deficient. But uh, if you think about how he is attuning to all the repertoires uh, in his environment, uh, we can appreciate his ability to communicate. And for that, we might need a different term, emplacement, because this is a more spatial term. And it talks about how we have to attune to all the repertoires in our environment in order to communicate. And one additional thing, we have to move also from a notion of meaning making as instrumental in, uh, in the sense that we think of meaning as based on efficiency of uh, mastery of um, communicating meanings without ambiguity, uh, with correctness. Uh, beyond that, there's also an issue of the ethical dispositions we bring in order to collaborate with others. So in this case, uh, Pat and uh, Chuck show a willingness to collaborate with Chill uh, rather than letting him communicate in isolation or all by himself. So this ability to work together in meaning making is also important for all these spatial repertoires to work. So I want to uh, illustrate these further developments through uh, studies that I'm conducting with international STEM scholars in the United States. Uh, as you know, uh, uh, in a lot of countries, these uh, scholars from countries like Korea, uh, China, Taiwan, India are compelled to do uh, tests like TOEFL and IELTS uh, to demonstrate their grammatical proficiency in order to uh, come to the United States or other countries for studies or employment. We pay, pay, place a lot of importance uh, in their grammatical proficiency in English. Uh, and uh, in, in my case, in this example, my focal participant is Ji Hoon. He's from South Korea. He had all his education in South Korea, including his uh, PhD. And he's here recently in the United States as a postdoc uh, in microbiology. And he readily accepts that since he is uh, new to an English speaking environment, he, he has to uh, develop a lot more proficiency in conversational skills in English. Uh, and uh, in an interview with him just before this video recording, he talked about uh, how he would like to develop more proficiency in English uh, conversation. But in this research group uh, that he's participating in, uh, he is uh, very confident and fluent. And uh, this is a very multilingual research group uh, in his university, uh, led by the person on the right side, uh, we'll call him Nick. He's an Anglo-American uh, uh, scientist who owns this lab. Uh, and then uh, there are others from uh, um, Ireland, China, and a, a, a graduate student from the United States. We might think uh, Ji Hoon needs a lot of proficiency in English in order to communicate with them, uh, that this is a very demanding uh, high stakes environment where uh, more will be required of Ji Hoon. Uh, but uh, Ji Hoon is the point man for this uh, experiment that they are doing. He conducts the research. He facilitates this research group uh, meeting, which is a weekly meeting. He brings his uh, results from his experiments and they troubleshoot together or plan uh, publications. So 
uh, my question is, how is he able to communicate uh, uh, so effectively in this environment? So let's listen to uh, see how uh, a lot of diverse semiotic repertoires work together in Ji Hun's favor. So this is uh, for, so this is series from one to seventeen. So one is actually same for the uh, each gel to make so like uh, so like control. So one is so cell extract and then non membrane protein membrane and then go through and washing step and then dissolution uh, and then concentration. And then this concentrated one was uh, we um, incubated with uh, the concentrated and nine is just dilution. Nine and ten. Ten is actually concentrated one, but the, it's not the one like yeah, 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 yeah. 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 So then the whole thing was incubated again. Then then this is flowed through yeah. after. Yeah. And so what we see is. Um, Ji Hoon's personal corpus, uh, as you see here, has a lot of deictic terms like this, this, that. I could go on highlighting in blue uh, in the whole transcript, many other uh, instances. Um, they also constitute adverbs like then, then, then. Uh, a lot of numbers like 17, 1, 1 to 10. Uh, what's interesting about these uh, terms is they don't have meaning in themselves uh, outside the spatial resources in the environment. Uh, so uh, well, note that in line six, there are two uh, this references. The first this is used contrastively with the second this. We wouldn't know that unless we looked at um, Ji Hoon's use of the cursor to point to the screen. So the fact that all of them are seated around the uh, monitor and looking at the visuals uh, helps um, uh, Ji Hoon to communicate his meaning. Uh, we also see th then that his uh, gestures help a lot in addition to the use of his cursor, but it also helps Ji Hoon himself in his communication. Uh, so uh, look at line 16, uh, um, he's looking for a word reincubated, but uh, uh, he takes a lot of time with a lot of pauses and hesitations to retrieve the word. And then he uh, moves his hands in a circling motion and then he gets the word. Uh, some applied linguists have called this uh, attack, uh, strategy thinking with your hands. Basically what's happening is uh, probably gesturing before getting the word uh, helps Ji Hoon uh, get some time to retrieve the word. Uh, or secondly, it might be that the gesture is embodied uh, or with that word. So gesturing helps him uh, remind, uh, um, uh, be reminded of the word. So uh, what we see is uh, gesture uh, is intimately connected with this thinking and communication in this case. It also helps other people to complete uh, Ji Hoon's turn. So uh, in, in the next case, in line 22, he is looking for another word and uh, there are hesitations and pauses like uh, we find in the whole transcript. Uh, this time he also uh, shows the length with fingers like this and uh, Nick supplies the word. So uh, Nick is able to stitch together or all the participants are able to work together and stitch together the conversation helped by the spatial repertoires, in this case, uh, the visuals and uh, gestures. Uh, let's, uh, but at the same time, we have to note that in addition to the spatial repertoires, the disciplinary repertoires are also important. Uh, so in this case, we can think of community repertoires, not in terms of only the speech community, but the community that uh, all these scientists belong to, the community of microbiologists and the, the uh, words, the terms they bring with them. So let's see. And then the washing, full washing, and then this is the illusion, and then this is concentrated. So this is histidine and study. So histidine and study actually. Yes, all right. So, this was history, uh, yeah, it was, yeah, it was history, but somehow this one's very bad on uh, uh, but the, but the, you see the band is actually, there are so many smaller band is still there, like this one, uh, right, yes. And, uh, so what we find is there are a lot of technical terms uh, that Ji Hoon uses in this uh, interaction. Uh, I have highlighted all of them in red. Uh, and the interesting is 
these words are also uh, not difficult for Jihun. So these community repertoires, uh, 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 we might call them, are uh, uh, very familiar to Jihun and a lot of other international scientists. Actually, they tell me in my interviews that these terms are not English as far as they are concerned. They are just science. Uh, these are uh, the words that anybody uh, in their field would use in any country. So it doesn't take a lot of effort uh, for Jihun to uh, use these words. Uh, in a lot of contexts, these words are so important that Nick sometimes supplies them when Jihun is thinking about them. Uh, so uh, think about, uh, look at uh, the uh, third example here from line 38 to 42. Jihun is actually using non-technical words to uh, convey his point here. He uses words like bad, dirty, then he smiles in line 40 because he's uh, not feeling confident that these words uh, really convey what he wants to say. Finally, he gives up and in line 42, he says like this and points to the screen and Nick supplies the uh, community repertoire antibody. So we can see that in some cases, the community repertoires are more important than the uh, uh, words from the speech community of English like dirty, bad, et cetera. Uh, and uh, they do uh, work together to supply those words. But this doesn't mean that uh, Nick is always uh, 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 collaborative in the interaction. Sometimes he corrects uh, the interaction, uh, the, the words that Ji Hun is producing, uh, and we have to figure out why he does that. So let's look at that. Uh, right, there's two bands out there. Like maybe. It's not quite clear as in this one, right? But the, it seems like there are two bands or some of the two sets of bands, right? Such a band there. So it looks like it's very similar to each other. And so which band do we think it might be after? Um, I think. So if you use your uh, other antibody, it's just a assay. Yes. Which band might be I I usually get at least two bands. This not this smaller two band, that, but this top band, maybe in this band. So those could be the sassay and possible. So in, on the first occasion, when uh, Ji Yoon says two band, actually he means four bands, that is two sets of bands. So that's a bit inaccurate. So Nick in line 50, 52 corrects him, uh, two sets of band, and Ji Yoon demonstrates uptake and corrects himself. But later on in line 60, Ji Yoon forgets that correction. And then he says this two band once again, but this time Nick doesn't correct him and just moves on uh, with the conversation. He demonstrates uh, what we might call uh, with Alan Firth, uh, a let it pass principle uh, that it's not necessary. Uh, probably because in this case, it's not critical. Uh, it's not a critical technical term uh, for the interaction. They understand the reference from the context. But what this shows is uh, a term that uh, Erickson introduced, rules of irrelevance. There is certain terms, uh, certain uh, repertoires are not important. So in this case, the words from uh, the community repertoire of English language speakers uh, is not rep uh, 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 critical. What's critical uh, seems to be the disciplinary terms. And uh, therefore for this, in this case, um, Nick doesn't correct him. But not one thing, in all these uh, corrections, uh, Nick is uh, demonstrating a lot of uh, collaboration and solidarity, uh, some uh, ethical dispositions of cooperativeness. Um, so for example, uh, we know uh, another term used by Charles Ferguson, uh, foreigner talk. That is a lot of native speakers correct non-native speakers in a condescending way. But Nick, in all these cases, is actually doing it in a way to move forward the conversation rather than pass judgment on uh, Ji Hoon. In a lot of cases, actually, he frames his turn completions as a question, meaning that he's letting uh, uh, Ji Hoon um, uh, function as a person with the epistemic authority. He knows uh, the, the subject matter. And so in line 59, uh, he, Nick is posing uh, a question, assuming that uh, uh, Ji Hoon has epistemic authority. And though Nick is the boss and the native speaker, he is changing his footing in this conversation in order for this activity to work. 
this research activity. And uh, he does this with a lot of solidarity. So let's look another uh, correction where actually Nick insists on the technical term because uh, according to the rules of irrelevance, this disciplinary term is important. Like, uh, some, there was some work from the same grade. Your scanner is pretty dead, right? Yes. So, clearly, this guy here, right? Crazy things. Yeah, yes. Actually, I didn't realize until uh, I, uh, I was using the MRI, the microscope, then the, uh, the what we find here is on the first occasion in line 101, uh, Nick uh, corrects uh, Ji Hoon by saying it's not a grid, it's the scale that he's talking about. In line uh, 120 one, uh, and uh, from 116 on, actually, Ji Hoon is looking for the word. In this case, uh, uh, Nick actually uh, supplies the word scale and um, insists on the uh, technical term and ji demonstrates uptake. Uh, so what we find is um, this word seems to be important according to the rules of irrelevance and uh, uh, Nick doesn't adopt a let it pass uh, approach. So what we find uh, is if you would think about this activity of a research group meeting, the hierarchical constellations would look like this. The spatial repertoires have a lot of importance uh, because um, that actually explains the way they are seated together. They are seated in front of a monitor with the visuals in front of them, the results from the experiment, and uh, they mediate in a very uh, intense way the conversation that's going on. Uh, the community repertoires uh, look secondary, but equally important uh, of secondary importance uh, beyond the uh, uh, repertoires from the English language speaking community. That is the disciplinary terms uh, seem to be very important. Uh, and the personal repertoires that uh, Ji Hoon brings with himself, uh, remember in the interview, he told me that uh, his uh, uh, ability to speak in English is limited, that he would like to improve himself. But those, his personal repertoires are mediated by these other repertoires and therefore uh, they don't really uh, harm the conversation. He's actually very confident and fluent. So from this example, uh, going back to uh, a, a pedagogical concern that uh, some of us have in the United States universities, where we have remedial instruction for a lot of international scientists, um, it looks like our remedial programs and uh, exams like uh, TOEFL and uh, IELTS uh, seem to think of competence in an individual way about what do each uh, 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 scientists bring with uh, uh, themselves. And also we think of uh, the grammatical knowledge as internalized, something they have mastered and they should be able to uh, display uh, in exams. Uh, and we focus a lot on grammatical structures uh, in these examinations. So we need to move to uh, think of competence uh, as distributed, uh, something that happens between people, between semiotic report, uh, uh, repertoires, and that they are all embodied. Uh, they, both the space, the body, uh, objects, all work together. Uh, and we have to think about the repertoires, not just as the linguistic ones, but polysemiotic. And I also uh, uh, demonstrated through these uh, examples, how we have to further move towards thinking about the workings of these semiotic repertoires uh, in a uh, more complex way with this, uh, which takes into account um, not only the people's qualified agency, but their ability to attune themselves to the social networks and ecological uh, resources uh, with a proper disposition, a moral and ethical disposition to work with other people in meaning making. Thank you very much. Hello. Hello. My name is Erin. And I'm Annalise. Today the two of us will present on deaf cosmopolitanism, theorising the relationship between cosmopolitanism and translingual practice.
So when we talk about calibrating, really this is a metaphor that deaf people use to describe their languaging practices. There are different ways that they sign this concept of calibrating. One is to sign a spinning dial on their torso, as seen in the picture. Or, alternatively, they sign two spinning dials, one above the other, on their torso. And these metaphors describe the act of aligning with another person. And this is essential to how cosmopolitan orientations and practices have been theorised. So what do we mean when we talk about calibrating? Essentially, this means the use of diverse semiotic resources, such as the use of international sign, of signing generally, mouthing, writing, or finger spelling, and this can be using different scripts or hand shapes, one and two handed. And as people calibrate, they quickly adopt new semiotic resources and they do this via rapid language learning. And one of the things we see is that there's a flexible use of these new features that they learn. Calibrating can be considered as a moral process. And this is where, in our paper, we conceptualise this as an anchoring of morality in our approach to the semiotic repertoire. So, for example, people might identify that they would prefer to use one particular sign over another because it gives them more of a moral standpoint. So these semiotic resources, such as particular sign languages or signs or which fingerspelling alphabet is used, these are all value laden. So whether someone chooses to use American Sign Language or British Sign Language, they might associate one or other sign with linguistic imperialism, for, for example, and therefore choose one over the other. So really this connects to language ideologies about what is right and what is good in terms of language use and behaviours. Cosmopolitanism theory defines cosmopolitanism as people being a citizen of the world. So, for example, a world traveller, a tour guide, or a shopkeeper in a metropolis. These are all cosmopolitans, they're citizens of the world. And their cosmopolitanism is manifested through their attitude, their orientation, their openness to difference and willingness to connect with others. Also, what practices they engage in, what skills they use, whether they engage in code switching between different languages. But also the abilities that they have to empathise with others that they're conversing with. So, essentially, we should consider language as central to cosmopolitanism as a practice. However, very few scholars in the area of cosmopolitanism have actually taken a language-centred approach. Therefore, when we consider deaf cosmopolitanism, this is really the idea that deaf people can, and do, connect across national and linguistic borders. And this is based on visual communication, and the fact that deaf people will calibrate their skills to enable easy linguistic border crossing and also to align with other deaf people use it, using the deaf same trope. We do know that there are power differences in terms of international deaf encounters, so for example whether people are mobile or immobile, whether they have equal access to resources and so on. And it's, rec it's important to recognise those differences. For us, however, our focus on deaf cosmopolitanism is that it's an ideal and an experience that we can explore.
So when we think then about linguistic cosmopolitanism, we see that there are a number of different views and perspectives on what this may comprise. The first of these is that people in society will use a lingua franca, a common language, for example, English in the spoken world. But people will then disagree and say, well, surely one language isn't truly uh, cosmopolitan. It's not based on an openness to difference, a sharing of experiences and all of those dynamics. The second is plural monolingualism, where people learn and use each other's languages, work with interpreters to aid communication, but really keep and celebrate linguistic diversity. The argument against that, again, is that, well, is it cosmopolitanism if it is not direct communication? If there is no calibration or real language adaptation or adjustment being made? And the third of these is translanguaging, which means mixing different bits of languages together uh, and other semiotic resources in order to communicate. So does this calibration really mean more cosmopolitanism? So let's look at some examples that um, we have from Aaron's data and my data in order to illustrate the first and the third of these. When we think of American Sign Language as a lingua franca, and we think of international sign as translanguaging when we think about the deaf community and their worlds. So the data that we're going to show you is from a research project. We're both part of the Mobile Deaf Project, which focuses on international deaf mobilities. We look at communication and translanguaging as well as intersectionality as our frames. Erin's data came from tourists uh, research that she conducted in Bali over a seven month period, looking at deaf tourists coming to that island from various different countries around the world in small groups, with two different tour guides operating on the island. The second data set is from my work on professional, uh, international professional deaf mobilities, uh, where I collected data from training courses, from international conferences and sporting events and such like from around the world. The first example that we'd like to show you is a clip of an interview uh, with a person who is Korean explaining about how international sign communication works, the goal of calibrating and aligning with other people. What is especially important in cross-signing is listening. If you take a selfish approach, it won't work and it won't be successful. Both signers need to take a curious view of the other's language and be exploratory in a cooperative spirit to really feel that synergy. But also what's important is to look at what the other person is trying to say, their aims. If you're both trying to discover what the other is saying, then you'll grasp each other as you go along. Also, the first time people communicate together, it's not going to be about wide ranging random topics. It's going to be about a particular topic, like where are you from? So it's going to have a narrow focus and people will have a shared motivation. And that narrow focus may grow wider and people may be more motivated to expand their conversation, whilst if people have different interests, they may stop communicating. So this is an explanation of international sign as a translanguaging practice uh, through the use of iconic and transparent signing, uh, the process of negotiation of understanding, the use of signs from different languages, and really this, this willingness, this eagerness to communicate, uh, the motivation being very important, as well as the importance of shared deaf experiences and concerns. Uh, these are central to knowing uh, what the other person is all about and, this, and it does assist with the communication process. The second example that we'd like to show you is from Wahoo, who is one of the Balinese tour guides that I mentioned earlier, who deals with international deaf people as they arrive on the island and as a deaf person, how he calibrates and language accommodates to meet their needs and what languages he manages to grasp or linguistic repertoires, whether that be mouthing, different signs, uh, and how he then re-employs those and uses them with the tourists when they arrive. To work as a deaf tour guide, I must use international sign and Auslan Australian Sign Language. Mostly those two, yeah, those two. If I want to meet Balinese deaf people, I switch to Basindo. 
to Indonesian Sign Language. Her work, I use international sign, so because it's more international, because we have Americans, Belgians, Dutch, German people come, so I sign international sign with them. With Australians, I switch the way I sign. I use more of the two-handed fingerspelling alphabet, which is a bit more difficult. Some people are slow in the way they sign, and I can understand them just fine. But others are really fast when they fingerspell with the two-handed alphabet, and I'll miss things. If a Chinese person comes, it can throw me off a bit. Um, I can remember some Chinese signs, like thank you, I do try and adjust. Uh, I use international sign with Germans and with the Dutch. And I calibrate my signing, yes, that's right, that's what I do. Before, when deaf people came and I wanted to communicate with them, I used to use international sign, but sometimes they didn't understand me, so I would have to readapt and adjust and perhaps use German signs. So I would maybe sign welcome, but use the mouthing for German willkommen. And so it's just a little bit of, of calibration, but it helps, and a little bit more international sign helps that process. And from another example, we shall now see an American woman who's travelled to New Zealand as a tourist and initially used um, her own sign language, American sign language, because she was with her brother, but local people saying to her uh, that ASL wasn't appropriate to be used and that she should calibrate to uh, BSL, which is a related language uh, to New Zealand sign language. So, for example, I went to New Zealand. My brother and I were using American Sign Language together and they admonished us. They said, American Sign Language is, is to be used in America. Here, you're to learn New Zealand Sign Language and forget American Sign Language. So, we were like, okay, fine, whatever. We'll put ASL to the side. And we started trying to use New Zealand Sign Language and it forced me to connect more to New Zealand and to experience New Zealand. And it's the same in Europe, though they often don't understand American Sign Language. So I then have to try my best to adapt. I try and sign more international sign, more British Sign Language, and just smush it up a bit. So those two examples show how deaf people acquire all these different bits of linguistic repertoires that they need. And when we talk about bits, we mean fingerspelling, mouthing, signs, the written word, all those parts of the repertoire. And there is an emphasis on learning, but respecting host country sign languages, having a respect and openness to that. Now with the Bali guide Wahoo, uh, he obviously would take uh, note of other people's sign language use and then reflect that back to them. These three examples that we've shown you um, do uh, emphasise this calibration process. But there are other points of view. Um, some people do still really uh, promote the use of American Sign Language as a lingua franca, as a language of communication across the world, and they take that more pragmatic attitude. So why is American Sign Language the potential lingua franca? Many sign languages in the world are based on American Sign Language, being one of the first reasons. Many people acquire American Sign Language as a second language, is a compounding factor, and this means that American Sign Language uh, is a suitable lingua franca in its, simplifies ver in its simplified version. In the Global South, in continents uh, such as Africa and Asia, we see American Sign Language use uh, peppered throughout the deaf populations in many different contexts. But there is tension, there is disagreement in the community about uh, linguistic imperialism or linguistic colonialism uh, and American Sign Language uh, taking that position in the deaf world and the fact that there's an association with also a lack of understanding because American Sign Language is often articulated very quickly, uh, particularly the fingerspelling, which leads to tensions between uh, the fact that people do understand ASL uh, and encourage and promote its use and those who prefer to avoid ASL as a lingua franca. I'd like, we'd now like to show you a person from India who talks about their use of international sign uh, with people who come to India from Europe and also those who know ASL.
I see it as being delineated between two groups. On one side, there are the Europeans, and some maybe from other countries too, but on the other side, there are Americans. The Europeans hate American Sign Language and they really try and avoid it. The other is that there are ASL users who really don't want to use international sign. And because they don't want that, I would sign American Sign Language with them. Some of them do accept IS and they do try and engage with it, but not many. Europeans, on the other hand, fully are ready to embrace international sign. And I forgot that sometimes, so I've signed ASL to them and their response is a little bit negative. They have a bit of an attitude about that. They see me signing American Sign Language and ask me if I've learned it in America. And I sense their disapproval. I apologise and I use other signs. So Europeans really don't want ASL as any communication form. People are different. So in conclusion, this process of calibration and choosing which parts of the language repertoire to use are what really characterises uh, international sign. And when we think about the language ideologies, uh, this, this, this moral idea comes into play as being shaped by this calibrating process. And so language ideologies you know, are all about the, the moral ideas about what bits from the semiotic repertoire are appropriate, in which contexts, and by whom. So, for example, uh, international sign, whether it's seen as good or right, uh, that affects somebody's willingness or ability to calibrate. Concerns about American Sign Language's imperialism or not, uh, whether you adopt a pragmatic or a language ideological attitude to that. The respect for the host country's sign language comes into play, as well as opinions about mouthings, finger spelling, and other spoken language elements which can be quite sensitive when we transpose those into sign language using groups from the majority languages. So there are many ideological connections with what's right about use uh, and what should be used in communication and many disagreements. So what this really shows us is that the semiotic repertoire that we see manifested is heavily infused with morality. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, whatever applies to your time zone. I'm very happy to be with you today, although I'm in my home office in Vienna. What, will, what you will see now on this first slide is what will happen in the next 20 minutes. I will raise the question why taking a subject perspective is relevant for exploring semiotic repertoires. In the main part of my presentation, I will draw on empirical work with language portraits to develop why communicative resources, even when situationally appropriate, are sometimes not available. To understand why such a gap can appear, I will then introduce the notion of the body image. Not only when understanding the repertoire as an individual set of resources and competences, but also in conceptualizations of spatial repertoires, all authors, in one way or another, refer to what individual participants bring into situated interaction. This can be in terms of the personal repertoire, as Fanny Cook or Kanagaraja, or in terms of linguistic uh, baggage, as Blomert termed it, or individuals' communicative repertoires, as Rhymes wrote, or a subject's repertoire, as we can read in a paper by Blomert and Bakus. Or, and here we are in the terminology that guides us today, uh, an individual semiotic repertoire, as Kusta and Altera wrote it. But no matter what the actual term that is used is, the underlying assumption that in all cases is, um, that, is that when participants engage in communication situated in space and time, they bring with them the history of their life trajectories a history in the course of which they have not only acquired competences and abilities, but, as I will argue, also have made bodily and emotionally lived experiences of language and communication. The crucial question is then, 
why in certain situations there can be a perceivable gap between acquired resources and the possibility to access and perform them in particular situated interaction. Or, put in other words, what makes somebody's acquired individual resources available as spatial repertoires unfold. I will introduce the notion of body image to take into account the fact that what is brought into the interaction is more than a set of resources and competences. The emphasis here is on an evaluative stance vis-à-vis -vis the resources. Um, the notion of body image is based on a phenomenological understanding of language um, that follows Merleau-Ponty. He sees language not primarily as a sedimented set of signs and rules, what he calls parole parlé, but rather as a creative gesture as parole parlante with which the subject relates to the world. In past years, in applied linguistics, a number of approaches have appeared which moved to the center of their interest, the idea of the subject as being bodily and emotionally involved in interaction with other subjects. This focus correlates with an understanding of meaning making as a cooperative dialogical process across different modes and sign systems. This entails also a growing interest in the material quality and the spatial embeddedness of the linguistic communicative sign as emphasized in post-human and process-based approaches that embrace a concept of effective practice, as Margaret Wetherell put it. My interest in the body image stems from working with first-person accounts on language experience and in particular with the so-called language portrait, which you can see in the right-hand corner. Um, in, in the portraits, participants visualize their communicative resources with reference to the outline of a body silhouette. The drawing serves as a point of reference in interviews or group discussions. I have collected in the past years in pedagogical, therapeutical and research setting several hundreds of such portraits. The language portrait has in the past years gained international recognition as a research tool that encourages participants to engage in metapragmatic reflections on their communicative practices and resources. What is seen as common ground in qualitative research concerning all kinds of narratives is equally valid for the language portrait. It is not seen as the representation of an individual repertoire as it is, uh, but as a situational and context-bound co-production. The empirical examples which I present in this talk are taken from a workshop at the Slovenska Gymnasia, the Slovene Gymnasium in Klagenfurt, Austria, a secondary school originally founded for the Slovene-speaking minority in the province of Carinthia. With its plurilingual orientation today, the school attracts a heterogeneous school population. The workshops were part of a long-term research project in which students attending the stream in which Slovene and German figure as media of teaching and learning were asked to evaluate their language learning experiences. Um, I chose the portraits by, drawn by two 17-year-old participants. I will call them Peter and Maxim. I chose these portraits because of the obvious similarities in the life trajectories on the one hand and the striking difference in how they evaluated their linguistic resources on the other. Both said that they grew up bilingually, spoke uh, predominantly Slovene um, with one parent and German with the other. Both attended bilingual classes in primary school and the trilingual in the secondary. 
Now, if we have a closer look at Peter's portrait in the drawing and subsequent group discussion, he presents German and Slovene as the most important resources. He starts his presentation, as you can see in quote one, so the legs are, one leg is German, one leg is Slovene. These are the two pillars. Also, one is the mother and one is the father. Actually, my father is German speaking, my mother is Slovene speaking. In the drawing, the German regional dialect forms the core of one leg, while his local Slovene dialect forms the other. The two standard languages are arranged around the cores. He conveys an image of himself as somebody who stands firmly on the basis provided by the two main languages. Through the symmetrical, symmetrical arrangement, Peter emphasizes that he wants to assign equal value to both. He also mentions, as you will see in quote two, Podjunsko, another Slovene, Slovene dialect drawn in his raised hand. This is Podjunsko, so to say my cousin is from Podjuna, and actually I speak with him only in his language, and when he was little he did not understand my dialect. To stretch out my hand to him, I spoke that with him and it worked. Peter placed Italian and English on his shoulders, indicating that they were a burden but also a backpack that he can unpack when need be. Now let's turn to the second uh, portrait drawn by uh, Maxime, where uh, he says in quote one, uh, I only looked at the proportions. How, how much of what language is there with me and one sees that for me German and English are the most important because I simply use both languages in everyday life most. Slovene is then ranked third and then come other languages. This ranking is all the more surprising as Maxim tells he practices Slovene on an everyday basis, at school, uh, with his family. Um, he sees himself as a proficient Slovene speaker and uh, characterizes Slovene as a beautiful, complex language, as you can see in quote two. English in contrast, he says, is a language that he uses mostly in computer-related activities. So a certain ambivalence to, uh, his, in his attitude to Slovene becomes apparent, although Maxim states that uh, he speaks the dialect on a regular basis. Um, he mentions one setting when he does not feel at ease, that, that is when the larger family uh, meets in his father's hometown. This is quote three. He says on my father's side, everybody speaks Corinthian Slovene and actually everybody knows it. It is the Corinthian Slovene that I find it quite difficult. And I feel weird when, um, when I then speak the written Slovene, and therefore I feel therefore I sometimes simply speak Corinthian German. It is, I don't know, I think it's simply my fear of speaking so wrong that it is simply only embarrassing. In the specific spatial arrangement, Maxim feels as he says weird, like an imposture and not recognized as a legitimate speaker. He evaluates himself, so to say, through the eyes and ears of the others. To characterize these situations of linguistic insecurity, he invokes the strong emotions of fear and embarrassment. Uh, in a counter move, Maxim presents himself as a confident user of English, a language which he claims is important for him in all spheres of life, but mainly when it comes to computers. In his language portrait, consequently, Slovene only occupies a smaller surface than German and English, uh, but it also appeared as somehow fragmented between head, hand, and stomach. So now if we compare the two, uh, the two language portraits, uh, we can see 
that there is a relatively similar set of resources present when one uh, takes a look at it um, with respect to the language learning trajectories. But in what emerges from their presentations, one can assume that their body image differs considerably. Peter presents different varieties of German and Slovene, the languages he grew up with, as the solid basis of his being in the world. It gives him confidence to build on for stretching out the hand, for, for example, to his younger cousin. Maxim, by contrast, finds his basis primarily in German and English. Although he assesses himself as highly competent in Slovene, he reports on feelings of embarrassment and fear uh, in certain situations. Um, the gap between his competences and his emotionally lived experience of language has its repercussions on the image he presents of himself as a communicatively acting speech endowed being. Both language portraits shed some light on how experiences, ideologies, and desires condense into a gestalt that can be captured in the notion of the body image, which in turn can help to understand the gap between acquired resources and the possibility of realizing them in situated interactions and bringing them into spatial repertoires. So now let's turn to the notion of body image, which is currently hotly debated in different disciplines, such as psychology, medical and health sciences, also sociology. And uh, the notion also has it made its way to some extent into popular discourse. First approaches to the idea of body image date back to the first half of the century. Um, Schilder is a name that first appears uh, in contact with the body image and he defined it as the picture of our own body which we form in our mind, that is to say the way in which the body appears to ourselves. Generally the body image is defined in relation to what is called the body schema, which from a neuroscience perspective is a set of neural representations of the body and the bodily functions in the brain, a sort of inborn map. The body image, by contrast, is seen, as Küchenhof and Agawala wrote, as an imaginary evaluative, thus intersubjective representation of the own body in the midst of a spatially and temporally structured world. Um, Francoise Dolto, a psychiatrist who also devoted a lot of um, interest to the body image, he says that, she says that all contact with the other, whether this is contact in communication or avoidance of communication, is underpinned by the body image. For it is the body image that, in the body image, that time intersects with space, that the past resonates in the present relationship. The body image can thus be thought of as an imaginary, highly loaded, evaluative representation of one's body in relation to other. The body image is formed and transformed in interaction with others and has in turn an impact on the subject's way of interacting. Therefore, the body image is seen as an inherently social, intersubjective and intercorporeal thing. It is developing from early childhood onwards and forming mostly unnoticed and constantly, um, and kind of uh, forming a constantly updated matrix that sticks to the subjects, allowing them to imagine themselves in terms of biographical continuity and coherence. 
um, in the notion of body image, language, or rather communication in the widest sense has a central position. Let's go back to what I quoted in the beginning from Merleau-Ponty's work, namely the distinction he made uh, between language as sedimented sign system and language as bodily gesture towards the other and the world. What is at stake for the body image is not primarily the sign system dimension, but the gestural dimension, the dimension that we foreground when we speak about semiotic repertoires. We found this gestural embodied dimension in Peters and Maxim's presentation of their language portraits. We saw how their lived experience of communication, their fears and desires, condense into a gestalt. Peter presenting himself as rooted in his two home languages, Maxim with his ambivalent feelings towards Slovene, which he counterbalances with a desire for English. This gestural and embodied dimension also becomes apparent in body metaphors and Lakoff and Johnson already pointed out that all the metaphors are somehow rooted in the flesh. Of course, the body silhouette of the language portrait suggests the use of body metaphors as Kusters and de Mölder concluded from an analysis of videotaped group discussions with signers, participants literally mapped their body when signing and gesturing in their narratives, thus performing and becoming the language portrait. If we return now to the question asked in the beginning, what kind of personal baggage do individuals bring into situated interaction or spatial repertoires? As I showed in my presentation, it is not simply a bundle of communicative resources acquired along the life trajectory, but rather an evaluative stance. Stance taking vis-a-vis -vis communicative resources includes ideologically driven evaluations of language or other semiotic means, e.g. statements about language as beautiful, useful, etc. It includes self-evaluation of acquired competencies, often in terms of comparisons, evaluation of oneself as interacting with others and the world <clears throat> that relate particular resources to bodily and emotionally lived experiences. Um, that is what I suggested to capture with the notion of body image, to put it in a nutshell, Doing communication depends not only on having resources and competencies one can situationally draw on, but significantly also depends on self-conceptions of one being in the world. I would now uh, uh, thank you very much for your attention and I'm looking forward to discussions, being live, being written via email, whatever. Thank you.